Spence has been involved in the Asset Leadership Network's National Asset Leadership Strategy. Uh, he's contributed to the 2020 version that was submitted to the uh, transition team. And uh, Spence, I'll turn it over to you to say a little bit about yourself before you start talking with Jim. Great, thanks, Mike. So yeah, I'm associate um, in the operations transformation industry um, at Grand Thornton in the public sector. Um, I recently graduated from the University of Maryland um, last spring in 2020. I graduated graduated with a major in supply chain management. So um, happy to be here. Um, I'm currently uh, supporting a budgetary uh, contract for the Veterans Affairs Office, and I'm also um, helping out on a customs border, customs border patrol project. Um, regarding asset management. Um, that was a recent uh, thing that I've gone into and, you know, I'm building up my asset management um, acumen and I hope to, you know, continue. And so thank you guys for having me. Um, and I'm really excited, uh, Jim, to talk with you about um, TC251 and uh, federal asset management. Um, so without further ado, Jim, um, I know you're a huge, um, you're a big influence within asset management um, for many years now. Um, but what I want to know is, how do you get started? Um, where did you first begin asset man in management? Great. Well, thanks, Spence. And it's great to be talking with you today. And it's different to be uh, the interviewee instead of the interviewer. So <laughs> I have to get used to that. Uh, so uh, interesting question. Uh, uh, I could answer it several different ways, but uh, uh, I was doing... Uh, some different kinds of work, did some retail work, got involved in, you know, running retail operations and uh, I had a lot of IT experience at the time. And of course, we're talking the dark ages, you know, like mainframe computers and people just starting to use barcodes and things like that uh, in the hardware and the home center business. So uh, I was looking for a new job and I literally answered an ad in the Washington Post. The only time in my career I ever got a job out of the newspaper. But, you know, the old, uh, like the old days again, an actual physical newspaper. And I was looking at the, at the Help Wanted ads, and there was an ad from uh, SAIC. Uh, and they use the term property management, of course, like the National Property Management Association. Uh, and I didn't really know what all that was about, but they had a, uh, their ad listed off a bunch of characteristics they were looking for, you know, or skills. And I had, them, you know, you know, uh, background in uh, tracking items and uh, computerized systems. And I don't remember what all else, but I uh, also have a background, I have a degree in math that I got in, uh, from Allegheny College. So that served me well. Uh, but I answered the ad uh, in the Washington Post, uh, had an interview on a Saturday morning with Mary Smith who uh, was based in La Jolla, California for SCIC and uh, got the job. Uh, uh, that was a very interesting job because SCIC, employee owned company at the time. Uh, and I used to get to go to La Jolla uh, mm -hmm. two weeks in the summer and two weeks in the winter. Wow. <laughs> so that was, that was a sweet job, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. interesting. Yeah, that was 1985. So it's a long time ago now. Yeah, love La Jolla though. Um, <laughs> that's really cool. So um, you started at this company, but when did you first get into the federal side of asset management? Yeah, uh, interesting. The you know the, the job I was hired for was government contract property management. So uh, government property provided to government contractors. So largely DOD. But we had NASA contracts and contracts with others. Uh, I didn't mention that when I answered the ad, one of the things that it talked about in the ad was familiar, familiar, familiarity with the FAR. And I went, the FAR? What's the FAR? So it turned out my sister had worked for the federal government uh, for a few years in logistics and supply chain at the, the Navy Depot in Mechanicsville, Pennsylvania. And I called her up. Of course, she couldn't. I know it's hard to imagine, but you couldn't just pick up your iPhone and ask it what the far was. You had, you had to do some research and uh, <laughs> managed to find out what it was. Uh, and 
you know, talk my way through that. <laughs> but uh, uh, so I started doing work, you know, working with the, the government audit agencies and, you know, the management system. I know internationally, people don't think that, th think that the idea of asset management systems was invented in either the UK or Australia in 19 late 80s or 1980s or 1990s, but uh, these management systems exist for government contractors as specified in the federal acquisition regulation for FAR uh, back to you know post-Korean War. Started as the ASPR, Armed Services Procurement Regulations, I think it was. Uh, but then you know branched out and doing started doing you know some direct work you know as you yourself are doing uh, for customers and doing support for the Department of Labor, uh, later the Federal Aviation Administration, uh, NASA, I did NASA support work for many years, where we was responsible both for uh, the government contract property that the government provided to contractors, but also uh, the government's own assets at uh, Goddard Space Flight Center and other places. They had a, at Goddard Space Flight Center, they had a sign uh, in one of the directorates that we supported uh, that I always love. And it said, science is people plus tools. And I thought, there we go, assets. So. Right, very cool. Um, you know, talking about, because I'm in the public sector um, yeah. and, you know, been working with now two different agencies. Um, what was your favorite agency to work, to work with? Oh, maybe uh, a little biased, but. <laughs> Well, I'd have to say it's NASA because I worked with, I did almost exclusively or, or mainly NASA support work for uh, 12 or 15 years with a couple of different companies. We used to drive up to Maryland, work for CSC and then Allied Signal, which became Honeywell, uh, supporting Goddard and you know some other centers. I was involved in some you know real major national level initiatives. I would say when we. Uh, uh, at that time, I had no, con you know, I could imagine millions, but I really couldn't imagine billions. And, you know, literally we were responsible for over half a billion dollars worth of uh, NASA assets. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and that's, that's just personal property assets. Uh, you know, the facilities, of course, would, you know, run the number up even higher. I think people don't appreciate in general the, the impact and effort around personal property asset management. Mm -hmm. uh, you think about, oh, there's a, a big stack of money spent on a facility. But then you think about all the items in that facility, whether it's science equipment or administrative equipment or uh, you know schools or whatever it is. And then you think those items have a life of, uh, the life of those assets is like a year to three years, maybe five years in some cases, 10 years. So over the course of the building, the cost you know, and the expense of keeping track of those assets, of course they can move, so they're a little more difficult to keep track of, uh, can far exceed uh, the cost of the building, even with maintenance costs included. I think you know, the latest numbers we have for like DOD, for example, show that uh, you know, and they only track, you know, the highest dollar value assets uh, in their systems, but they, uh, the value of personal property assets ex exceeds the value of real property assets, which is pretty stunning when you consider the real property assets they have. Yeah, that is impressive. That's crazy. Um, so now that we're talking about all these assets, um, I know you've been a big influence um, within it, and I want to kind of bring up TC 251 and, you know, the revisions that you guys want to make regarding uh, ISO 55,000. Um, so can you touch on that a little bit? Yeah, sure. Uh, we have a number of people in the ALM that are in leadership roles involved. Jack Dempsey is is the head of the one of the working groups for TC 50, 251, or for those that don't know, Technical Committee 251, that's responsible for the ISO 55,000 asset management system standards. Uh, Rich Culbertson, Jack Dempsey, uh, I'm probably forgetting somebody now, but uh, you know, have many people involved in taking, you know, 
leadership roles and being thought leaders. So it's, uh, it's really quite exciting uh, to be involved in. And I was the head of the uh, head of delegation and you know chair of the committee from, uh, you know, had one of those roles since near the beginning, uh, you know, when we first started out uh, working with ASTM to host the US technical advisory group. That's, you know, the ANSI approved member uh, from the United States. Um, so I got to be like an international diplomat. I was like, I was representing the US. I thought, wow, you know, and yeah. there was, we had really broad involvement in the US from a number of different sectors. So a lot of the, the mirror committees is what they're called from different countries were focused in one or more sectors, you know, uh, not to oversimplify, but, you know, the Brits are largely engineers, uh, you know, uh, from uh, the Netherlands, they're, uh, they're in the electrical industry, largely. Uh, Canada, there's a lot of people from the municipal uh, area involved. Australia's railroads and mining. Uh, but we had broad involvement from those areas and others in the U.S. So it was a really amazing opportunity, you know, coming from a background largely in personal property management, although I have background in real property management as well. Uh, but to just understand that there's companies that look at whole utilities, you know, like a power plant as an asset, because they own water plants and uh, utilities in multiple countries around the world. It's like, wow, you know, it's, uh, it's a stunning, stunningly large field uh, and opportunity. There's maybe uh, Dodd Better, who was, uh, wrote a great book you know, in the asset management field uh, several years ago, said, you know, just central governments around the world have about $175 trillion worth of assets. And, and most assets are actually held by, you know, a lower levels of the government, you know, like in the United States, roads and schools and all that are owned at lower levels. So it's uh, it's massive, and that's with a fairly narrow description of assets. You know, if you start broadening the the description of assets as as we're starting to do, and what the TC is starting to get into, uh, and Rich Culbertson is uh, uh, a big one that's behind this, is intangible assets. Uh, you know, actually, it was uh, on a call with a friend of mine, uh, who's a uh, in Tennessee, got elected to the school board in Tennessee. And he had spoken at one of our events. And of course, he knows me. So he, he heard about asset management, whether he wanted to or not. Uh, and he was interested in making a pitch to the other, to the school board, the other members, uh, the other board members about asset management. Thought it, you know, it'd be worthwhile. They had started to talk about like solar on schools and like what else could they do? And I said, well, we talked about you know, the scope of assets, you know, real property, personal property, what does that include for a school? And I said, but you can also include water as an asset for a school. If you don't have water, the school's, you know, closed down. And he said, oh, wow, good story, because uh, just in the, you know, the last month or two, they had had the state water department come out and do tests on the water in all their buildings. And they found out that they needed to have put water filters in place because some of that water supply wasn't up to snuff. So uh, the impact we can have in this profession is remarkable. Uh, it truly really is. That was a rambling answer, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Went all over the place. That was really interesting though. Um, so you're talking about assets and um, we've talked about this before, but the difference between asset management and managing assets. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And kind of the verbiage between that and um, can you kind of go into that a little bit? Yeah, we came up with a, a new idea, I think. Mm -hmm. And it's been uh, Jack Dempsey, as I mentioned before, uh, works for Definitive Logic and is an ALN senior fellow, uh, wrote a paper uh, that's posted on the TC251 website that you can access. Uh, talking about the difference between asset management and managing assets. And in fact, that discussion had been a part of the development process of the ISO, ISO 55,000 standards, uh, you know, understanding the difference. And really, 
a key thing to know about the ISO 55000 standards is uh, they are about a system and a, 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 for asset management, but that system really only goes down to the uh, asset lifecycle level. There's nothing in the standard that describes what lifecycle steps should be, uh, or because there's just many different versions. Of it. So it's a very intentional, you know, sort of cutoff point. And there's of course lots of great information about that, and it's where a lot, most of the money gets spent and all that. But what's been was missing, and what the standard brought was this systems approach to it. So Jack wrote this paper on managing assets and asset management, and uh, so the point is. The, con the, 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 the dichotomy is real. So managing assets is about these life cycle activities and asset management is about strategic thinking you know, and about value from assets, which is really, the standards are about value from assets. Uh, but we didn't have good terminology. Terminology is just crucial to standards. It's, it's a really, really big deal. Uh, especially when you consider it's going to be translated into who knows how many languages. Uh, I think 55,000 has already been translated into around 18 or 20 different languages, maybe. Wow. Uh, so uh, for example, translating asset management into Spanish is gestión de actividades. You know, a terrible accent, can't speak Spanish, but you know, so activities, you know, of management and uh, so the distinction between asset management and managing of assets is barely understandable in English. I mean, you have to explain it and it doesn't translate in general at all. So the, the, the idea was after, <laughs> I've actually written multiple white papers about this that I then put on the shelf, have to dig them out again someday. But uh, the current current thinking and is uh, we, I submitted a, a PIP, a product improvement plan to uh, the TC, which is their official improvement process, continuous improvement, uh, uh, that laid out an idea. And the idea is that that dis distinction between managing an assets and asset management is real and very important, uh, but we need better terms. And it, it seemed clear to me that there was an easy way to do it. Uh, after much thought. But uh, one part is asset value management. And the other part is asset life cycle management. For those familiar with 55,000, you could say that the, the SAM, the Strategic Asset Management Plan, is about asset value management and AMPs, which are perhaps inappropriately, uh, you know, uh, mentioned, although not very much, in 55,001, uh, the asset management plans are really about life cycle activities. Uh, it can be confusing what's an AMP and what's a SAMP, depending on how you talk about it. But the real concept of AMP is when you're getting describing life cycle activities. So that allows us to have terms that I, uh, certainly not an expert in 18 languages, barely one. But uh, I think that's something that would be translatable and also understandable so that when we're talking about 55,000, we're not explaining what asset management means because everybody knows asset management means, you know, doing physical inventories in the federal government. I mean, that's, that's what it's been is understanding what you have and not even depending on the record cap, going out and look at it again every year or two or three. Uh, so, I think it would help us greatly to be able to say, we're talking about asset value management and how the value of those assets supports the mission and objectives of the organization. Uh, just, you know, it's a powerful concept. Yeah, that is. Um, have, you, have you seen any or felt any roadblocks because of this, um, this struggle with terminology um, and that being implemented, the ISO 55K? Um, and previous ones being implemented into federal agencies. Yeah, I think, you know, the, the short version is as a politician say, if you're explaining, you're losing. Mm. Uh, I don't, and I, yeah, when you say asset management, you have to explain it. Right. 
when you say asset value management, I think the explanation is, I, I think it's obvious, but yeah. you know, there's always a discussion to be had about how broad it is, which is another thing that can be a roadblock because you can't talk, start off telling people it's this broad <laughs> because it'll, it starts to sound like the theory of everything. Uh, one of the, the starting points of my involvement in standards was with mm -hmm. ASTM, Committee E53, uh, uh, that was started between uh, the NPMA, myself and a group of uh, other people, John O'Shaughnessy, Lyle Hesterman, uh, and uh, then Steve Michelson, you know, uh, took the lead and helped it move it forward. He was from the Department of Energy. Uh, but John O'Shaughnessy wrote an article for the ASTM magazine called The Third Resource. And it still resonates with me and I use it in presentations all the time. But organizations need three things, uh, any organization, people, money, and stuff. So there's, there's many, many systems in place for managing people and certainly for money, but there haven't been for assets. But kind of until now, I mean, we are seeing exponential or explosive growth in information about asset management now. Uh, you know, uh, how much of it is chicken and egg with the standard, I'm not sure, but I think it has really brought it to people's attention. I remember when uh, the standard was published in 2014, we said, boy, if we could just get asset management, a little blurb about asset management in Bloomberg or the Wall Street Journal, so people started to be aware of it, that'd be really great. And now I think it could say there's not a senior executive or policy leader anywhere that doesn't understand, have some idea of what asset management mm -hmm. is and what it's about. Yeah, that's a great, that's awesome to see from 2014 till now that it has grown a lot. Um, and coming from that, where do you see you know, asset management going um, in the near future? Yeah, great. Alex Berenblick uh, from LMI just shared an interesting article this morning about, uh, I'm not sure what the website was, maybe the New Republic or something, but it talked about, you know, the Zoom, you know, economy and Zoom workplace or working in it and how this isn't going to go away. I mean, like for us, this idea, you know, this is something we can't do in person. We have people you know, from all over the country involved, you know, and all over the world involved in these, you know, every week uh, in workplace, you know, people are starting to, you know, people are working from home, like you said, Spence, you know, you're working from home. So, uh, you know, you don't need a building to be in anymore. You know, your assets, you know, uh, I don't know if you have your own asset, your own computer equipment, but you know, you either have your own, and so it's uh, you know, bring your own device, or uh, Grant Thornton provides it for you, or, or maybe both. Uh, and it's going to change what's important, I think, a lot, and what assets get invested in. I mean, you know, it's just like you wouldn't build a coal fire energy plant now because nobody had invested in because it, it's oh. it's going away. It's just going away. Uh, you know, would you, you know, do we want to keep spending money on computer roads uh, so people can drive somewhere? Uh, I don't know. And even, you know, I've got the new subway line out here near where I live, the Silver Line. And you go like, wow, you know, it's good that it's there, but how's that going to, what's the economics of that going to be in the future? You know, there's mm. this article Alex shared shares, you know, the downward spiral of less people ride, so you cut back service, so then less, even less people ride, and you cut back service more, and then you defer maintenance, and then it's not safe, and then, you know, uh, it needs an asset management solution in any case, but it's a good example, perhaps. It needs to be uh, those far-reaching asset management uh, decisions and plans needs to be based on organizational objectives that are understood and communicated. What's the, you know, what is, you know, what's the future, excuse me, of transportation? What's the future of work uh, in this area and in others? It's uh, fascinating. 
as has been this conversation, I've enjoyed uh, uh, Spence driving this, and uh, thank you. Say that um, uh, that was a Government Executive Magazine. That, yeah. that very informative article. Uh, Alex uh, shared it with me too, and Alex uh, had a question uh, back when you were talking Sam uh, and amps. Could yeah. possibly the amp be a technical asset management plan, a TAMP? Yeah, I actually have a presentation somewhere that uses that term in there somewhere. Uh, although I think I called it a tactical asset management plan to get TAMP. But there was a strategic and operational, but there wasn't a tactical one in the middle. Uh, I, I meant to say technical. Tech, tactical. <laughs> if I didn't, that's what Alex uh, recommended. And then um, Chris technical, that's That's technical is is tactics and technology. I like that, Mike. You just made up a new word. <laughs> <laughs> Good thing we're recording this. Um, and then Chris Golly made a comment saying that um, the U.S. TAG needs more members from U.S. to work on revisions of ISO 55001. Jim, you want to make a pitch on that? Yeah, uh, recently, uh, in fact, it was Rich Culbertson is the one that suggested it, I believe. Uh, although Chris is now, of course, the head of the U.S. TAG, which we're really excited about. Uh, in a long time, you know, a lot of experience in the development of the standard and a great guy. Uh, but uh, it used to be $1,000 to join the US tag and $100 a year per person. Uh, and now it's just $100 to join and then $100 a year. So it is the opportunity for many more people to be directly involved. Uh, you know, I would personally urge people uh, if you want to know what's going on, you know, uh, we, like ALN and other organizations, are good at getting some of that information out. You can join just to sort of, you know, keep your ear to the, you know, the winds and where they're blowing. But it's really an opportunity to contribute. And again, I think in this world, in the Zoom world we're living in and probably will in the future, uh, you know, in the past it had been being a delegate. Uh, to these ISO events had meant going to a lot of cool places. I went to South Africa and Prague and Japan and just, wow, awesome places. Uh, but now the meetings, you know, for now and, and moving forward in the foreseeable future are virtual meetings, which means uh, people can participate with a, a minimum amount of time away from the, you know, their desk and their office and with a uh, minimal investment of personal or company resources in terms of uh, travel in a hotel and, and things like that. So it's a great opportunity for people to get involved. 